since they have come and could almost be considered native? Or is there a regional thing? You know, the right plant for this place. Do, we, do you approach native or do we approach native as a regional thing? Like your state, like this is native to your state or this is native to your eco region. And if you have ever been um, to the, the Western plant finding site or if you have ever been to the native plant trust site, you can find the eco regions which are different than hardiness zones. So these are regions that certain plants have naturalized. These are regions that certain, certain plants naturally grow, which is very different from everything else. So you can divide your plants however you want. Some people are very strict and say everything that grows within 50 to 100 miles of my exact location. Some people say anything that grows on the Eastern seaboard is native to this area. So like I said, it's a it's very broad definition. So for instance, Baptisia, false indigo, is generally native to much of the United States. It's found in the prairie states, but it's also found up here in the Northeast. <clears throat> Tiarella, one of my favorites. However, depends on the Tiarella. <clears throat> Certain Tiarellas, like the Colina, is down, is more of like mid-Atlantic and south. Cordifolia, which would be considered, I guess, the native or the running foam flower, <laughs> comes all the way up the East Coast and out, you know, out into the Michigan area, et cetera, and into lower Canada. So again, is this guy native? Could be, depending on your definition. Then this one, well, if you're in this area, definitely is. <clears throat> and then we have black locust. Some of you may or may not have dealt with black locust. Black locust actually is a native. So many people consider it an invasive plant, but it's actually an aggressive native and it's native to much of the United States, almost the entire United States you can find uh, and Southern Canada, you can find black locust. So, you know, when you're playing with natives and who you call a native, the, the, the definition is extremely broad. But then we have to ask ourselves, why native? Like, what is the benefit? Like, okay, so this guy has now said, if native was a drinking game, we'd all be passed out by now by the number of times that he has said native in the first five minutes of this presentation. So what is it all about? Why is it so important? Well, let's look at these two geraniums. We have geranium horticum and maculatum. <clears throat> maculatum, the wild geranium, is our native. The other is a cultivar and a greenhouse grown. One is, one is an annual, absolutely beautiful. The other one is our native perennial. So the bumblebees both like this plant. The bumblebees and the honeybees love these plants. They're generalists. So why native? Because the mining bees love the wild geranium. The sphinx moth loves the wild geranium. <clears throat> the white mark tusket loves the wild geranium. In fact, <clears throat> There's over 30 species that like the wild geranium that thrive and actually need this as part of their life cycle. Whereas the non native or the cultivars are only available and only desired by the generalists. So, if we are going to plant our landscapes, if we are going to think of ourselves as a part of nature, then in our managed landscape, because we've now taken over our little piece of the world, well, we should do right by everybody else who shares that landscape with us. Because just because we you know, pay the taxes on it, doesn't mean that anybody in that list really cares. And so it is kind of our responsibility to, <clears throat> to, be, to think about and consider everybody else who shares that plot of land with us.
So sometimes planting natives is obvious. It will be, and this is oftentimes what I get. People say, ooh, I want the hummingbirds. Ooh, I want the monarchs. This is, this is what I want. This is why I want to plant natives. And sometimes, and oftentimes with pollinator gardens, this is what people are thinking about. And it's real obvious why we want to plant bee balm and honeysuckle, because we want to have the nectar for the butterflies and the nectar for the hummingbirds. But other times, those connections to natives aren't as obvious like this. So those hummingbirds, as they come up from the south, are going to collect the fur, for, for lack of a better term right now, off of the emerging ferns, those ostrich ferns, et cetera, all those fiddleheads out in the woods, they're gonna collect that and they're gonna line their nests with it. So there's more to natives than just our pretty flowers, which leads us then to the big question. The question that I get call, asked all the time, the discussion, this discussion I find myself in oftentimes, I went on a wonderful walk in the woods with Dan Wilder and we had this discussion because I was like, what question do you get asked all the time? He's like, okay, we're gonna say our biggest question on three. And this was it. How do we plant for climate change? Do we still plant for our current zone? So our hardiness zone here in much of Massachusetts is generally five. Oftentimes we can move into, we can start moving into six because our winters haven't been so bad that we've ruled out many zone six plants. <clears throat> so do we still plant for our current zone knowing that the temperatures are going to change? What are the impacts if we plant a zone ahead? There really isn't a right answer to this question. So these are just the questions that those of us who plant natives and deal with landscape design need to ask ourselves. What role do natives play in climate resilient landscapes? And these right here are the top 25 plants for supporting wildlife <clears throat> and pollinators. So we have our oaks, we have our cherry species, we have our willow species, the black willow, we have our birches, poplar, blueberry, dogwood in the shrub form like the red twig, goldenrod, asters, viburnum, as I told you, I love it, spirea, there is a native spirea, the wild strawberry, that woodland strawberry, excellent lawn alternative. If you do not walk all over your lawn all the time, the wild strawberry is an excellent ground cover and lawn alternative. Helianthus, the sunflower, Jersey tea, Joe pie weed, Carex pensylvanica, sun lupine, Violets, the wild geranium that we talked about, black-eyed Susans, milkweed, wood phlox, bee balm, monarda, little blue stem, and lobelia. If you have any or all of these in your landscape, or if you don't have any of them and you want to introduce some natives, here are your top 25 for your supporting wildlife and for supporting pollinators. These are the, the heavy hitters when it comes into the landscape. So if you can introduce one, you make a huge impact. So what are the role of woody plants? Because back in this list, we have a lot of things like black-eyed Susan and Lobelia. Those are herbaceous plants. Those are perennials. So we're talking about woody natives. So the role of woody natives in the overstory. So in the overstory, when you're layering the landscape, the overstory are the big trees. The big trees like the oaks, the, the maples, the pines, those big 40, 60, 100 foot trees, their role is to create shade. Their role is to buffer wind, create food and nesting habitat. Here in Arlington, we have nesting bald eagles. Well, those bald eagles only nest in the tallest of the pine trees. They're not going to nest down low. So if we take down all the super, super tall trees, we're taking away habitat, nesting habitat for those hawks, for the eagles, et cetera. Those big birds like to be way up high. <clears throat> the overstory is the first line of, I guess, defense, we'll call it, for rain capture because raindrops fall at 20 miles an hour. 
So the overstory catches those raindrops and begins to slow their speed. So by the time they make it to the ground, they're at a speed that can absorb into the ground. And it's not going to hit the ground so hard to compact the soil. And it's not gonna hit the ground so hard and so fast to create erosion. And then again, for erosion control because they slow the raindrops and erosion control because of their root systems. So the understory trees, these are, these are the shorter trees and all of, this, all of the shrubs that we'll be talking about. So when we're talking about succession, so in a, in a if you walk into a natural, a natural wood, you have all of these trees, especially in this area, oftentimes there's a lot of beech trees and they're very small. And those beech trees could actually be like pretty old and they're just waiting waiting for that opening in the canopy. And the moment there is some light that comes through the canopy and they have a place to grow up and do their thing, that's exactly what they do. So that is what the understory really is there for. Part of it is succession. If a tree falls down, they are there to kind of fill the void, either in the form of another tree or they will fill the void in the form of shorter trees and shrubs. Ground level wind buffering. Wind buffering is a huge thing, you know, and that's what a lot of the landscapes and a lot of our trees have actually evolved to do is to break wind, wind and buff, buffer wind for us. <clears throat> Food and nesting habitat on the lower levels, because there are many birds, etc., that will nest in the in the lower, denser, shorter shrubs, etc. Rain capture again and erosion control. So right plant, right place, right reason. So you've probably heard, if you've been doing this long enough, you've definitely heard right plant, right place. And I add right reason. Because we need to have that, having the right plant in the right place is one thing, but we need to be putting it there for the right reasons. And it has to be more than just because we want it. So if your area is sunny and dry, plants you want to plant plants that prefer sunny and dry conditions, not other plants just because you might want them. If you don't have room for a large tree or shrub, do not plant a large tree or shrub. Sizing is one of the biggest things. It's one of the things that I deal with almost all the time. I will come to a house and their house will be getting swallowed up by a tree and or a shrub and they'll be like, oh, well, I put those in 25 years ago and they were right up to my knee. Well, that's true. But just like children, they get really big. So we have to, we have to be aware of the ultimate size. So when we plant, we need to plant five, 10 years out. Nature thinks in deep time. Nature thinks even beyond 10 years out. You know, we're a little more, um, we're, not as, we're not as patient. So we try to, you know, fill things in and I'm going to talk to you about ways to do that. But we have to think when we're placing things like trees and shrubs, we need to think about what they're going to be like in 10 years, in 20 years. And if it wants to be 60 feet tall, then don't put it or even 10 feet tall. Then it probably does not want to be 12 to 14 inches away from your foundation. If the soils are poor, Plant, plants that grow in poor soils. This is all about knowing your condition, right plant for the right place. That being said, a little bit of alteration can open up the, the potential species that can grow in your area. So I am not for super amending any sort of area because what happens is if you super amend your area to try to grow a specific plant, you are going to have an extremely high maintenance garden. If you want to be a casual gardener, a low maintenance gardener, a hands-off gardener, then creating super environments for plants is not the way to do it. You can adjust your soils and that's what we're going to be talking about because one thing that we need to do in our urban and suburban environments is adjust our soils and get our soils right. Because for the most part, especially if we live in an area with a new development, if we're living in a relatively new house, all those soils have been turned up. 
and we do, and we have our soils are probably more dirt than soil. So dirt becomes soil when it has a robust amount of organic matter in it and when it has a robust microbial life in it. So that's when dirt, which is just minerals, becomes soil, which is a living organism. And if we live in a, a relatively new house or on new construction or on a, a piece of land that had been mismanaged for a long time, chances are there's not a lot of organic matter in our soil. Chances are there's not a lot of life in our soil. And if we are going to ask native plants to live in our soil, then we need to somewhat recreate the conditions that they evolved with for thousands of years. The case in point, which I use all the time, which is not a native plant, but I find people um, make this mistake all the time, is people want a native plant. So they go to they go to Weston, they go to Garden in the Woods, they go somewhere and they get trillium. Trillium, because trillium is absolutely gorgeous, but trillium likes to live in six inches or more of leaf duff, of, le of decomposing leaf litter. And so these people who went out and spent a whole lot of money on trillium, put them into landscapes and then blow every single leaf off of that, off of their landscape and out of their garden every single fall. And they put down, you know, uh, like they'll, they'll put down a dyed wood chip or something like that. And then they wonder why their trillium didn't live. It's because it wants six inches of leaf duff, decomposing matter. It wants a whole lot of friends in the soil. And if it doesn't have any friends in the soil, and if it doesn't have that soft organic bed that it's used to, that, that's one that gets very picky. <clears throat> and that's one that also costs a lot. So people get frustrated when it dies. Always ask yourself, how much work do you want to put into plants? And what do you want to get out of your plants? So let's start with flowering trees. And along the way, if you have any questions, please throw them in the chat. Just make sure that, you know, because I'd love to have the discussion on the other end. But I also don't want to keep you here all Sunday evening, so I'm going to try to keep it moving. So Aurelia, the devil's walking stick. This is a super funky plant. Cool flower, very funky. Leaves that just don't look like they're from here. They look like they're from some sort of a tropical land because they are so giant and so just very exotic looking. It is, it does have a thorny stem. So it's not necessarily accessible and some people have an aversion to it because of this. However, because it gets so tall <clears throat> and because of those leaves, and because of this very cool, gorgeous flower that the pollinators absolutely love, this makes a funky addition to the landscape and maybe in an area that, you know, you're not in all the time because you don't want to get hung up on the thorns. But this is one of those that if you had it in the back of a garden or if you had it in a portion of your property, so, you know, relatively sunny portion of your property, you know, people would be like, oh, wow, what's that? This is just one of those conversation pieces. And it's got these wonderful berries in the fall that the birds absolutely love. So you have the pollinators, you have the birds, and you have great fall color. And we're going to be talking a lot about fall color throughout all of this. The flowering dogwoods. This is what everybody's going to be wanting pretty soon. Dogwoods, all of our native dogwoods, the Florida, are all going to be coming into bloom very soon. I absolutely love this plant. It is, I love this tree for so many reasons. It is an understory tree. So it only gets to be about 15 feet tall. You may have seen some of them get taller, but they usually stay about 15 feet high. If you think about, when you're thinking about height, every 10 feet is a story of a house. So a 15 foot high tree is going to just get to the, say the bottom, to mid windows of your second story at full maturity. So when you think about, when you're thinking about planting a tree near your house, and when you're thinking about trees, if it says it gets to be 20 feet, that's gonna be up into your second story. You know, 30 feet is probably gonna be taller than your house, most houses. 
unless you have a very tall house. But 30 feet is usually about the pitch of your the, the roof, the pitch of the roof on the house. So this is a great tree because it puts up with a lot of conditions. It will take the part shade, which is what many of us have. Many of us have properties with big mature trees around it and we're looking for something to fill our lawn. We're looking for something to bring closer to the house. This is a great one. It's got a beautiful flower. To me, it's a beautiful flower. It's a little understated compared to the Kuza, it's, its Asian cousin, which has a whole lot more flair. This is a little understated. It's, think of it as a New England thing. We're understated in New England. We're not super, super flashy. So the berry on this one is a whole lot smaller, but this is great for uh, pollinators and insects. And it's awesome for the, uh, for the birds in the fall once those berries come out and it has gorgeous fall color again, which is just, so you have those nice red berries and you have that gorgeous fall color, but you also have that really sweet flower that is right now it's coming out and it's super teeny, um, you know, when it, when it starts and then it actually just keeps growing and growing and gets bigger and bigger. Last season, we had an awesome dogwood season. I don't know what this one's going to bring. We've had a pretty dry spring so far, so I don't really know uh, how our dogwoods are going to look this year, but it is absolutely one of my favorites. So the pagoda dogwood, another small tree, totally different branching structure, totally different floral uh, presentation and everything. This is great for shade, part shade to shade. And it's got, it's got branches that kind of, that hence the name pagoda, they kind of, they come out in, in, uh, in tiers. So instead of just branches that go everywhere, they have tiered tiered branches. <clears throat> they have this wonderful white kind of foamy flower that appears all over and you can see those tears in that right there in the large in the larger image. They have this wonderful uh, foamy flower. Like I said, it will take those shadier conditions and then they turn out, you know, into these fun little, I think they're fun, you know, fun berries. The other tree, uh, the other shrub in this same kind of category, and you can tell by the flower because it has that same foamy flower, are the red twig dogwoods or the shrub dogwoods. These are great for sun all the way to shade. The more sun they have, the more robust they are. So I usually like to put them in a part sun condition. So part sun would be four, say four to seven hours, six, six hours plus usually is full sun. So six to eight or more is going to be full sun. Shade is going to be four or five hours or less. So that part sun is where you get that morning light. So you might get, you know, five, seven hours in the morning or so. Um, so that's when these really, I find they really thrive. They don't want to bake on the south side of the house. And if you put them in deep, deep shade, they will do fine. And they will be happy there because that's how they evolved, but they won't be as full and robust as you want them. But these are great because of the red twig dogwoods, once they've done their thing, they have the great, they have the great spring flower, but then in the, and they have the cool fall color. And then when they're all done, they have these twigs that turn bright red. So when you have those sticking up in the snow, it's extremely beautiful. When you have something like this in front of your evergreens, it's very beautiful or playing off your foundation, the foundation of your house. So you want to, when you, when you're designing and when you're thinking, you're like, you know, you have this shrub and this shrub is going to be pretty much green from, you know, June to September, which isn't like too wow. However, it kicks in again in the fall and it kicks in in the winter. So it has its season, which is great because in design, and I'm, this is something that I wasn't planning on going into, but it's something that I teach in my design courses. In my design courses, you want to think about, and we'll talk about this again and again, as far as foliage is concerned, design from the harder months back. So think about what a plant looks like in winter. Does it have a cool branching structure? Does it offer a red twig? If so, that's great. And then you work your way back from there. How about the fall? What does it offer in the fall? And we're gonna recap on this so I won't go too, too much into it. But then if it turns green for a while in the summer and, and it isn't very dramatic, that's okay because you'll stop thinking about it and then it'll show up again. 
This is the thing when we're dealing with evergreens or we have too many evergreens on our property, evergreens for the most part look the same throughout the year. So essentially, if you look at something and it's always there and it's always the same throughout the year, you're gonna stop noticing it. However, if this has a spring flower that you can look forward to and then you forget about it and you don't really notice it, it just falls into the background until the fall and the winter, that's great because then you'll never get bored with it. And you'll always have something to look, look forward to and it will always keep your landscape changing. For instance, when I'm designing with stone, I know this is a woody native, but I'm gonna just kind of drop this on you really quick. When I'm designing with stone, I'll oftentimes plant to hide that stone either partially or completely at some point in time during the season. So that in the winter and the spring, that stone is out and you can really appreciate it, but it's not there in your face all the time and you forget about it, or I'll hide it partially and it will take on a new life for itself. So you wanna keep your landscape changing and by doing things, adding things like a red twig dogwood is great because it has that spring flower and then you kind of forget about it until fall and winter. This is another one that kind of comes out of nowhere and then fades into the background, <clears throat> the red bud. Now in planting the red bud, this is a, this is a wonderful, absolutely gorgeous uh, in the pea family. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely get out to Weston because they're going, they are blooming soon. Um, if they're not in bloom already. And it just has wonderful blooms all up and down the, uh, all up and down the branches, which is just really funky because you normally picture it, a bloom like somewhere else on the plant, usually at the end of the branch or, you know, somewhere between the leaves and this before it even leaves out, it gets these blooms all over the branches in, in like a purpley pink and this white. Now, the thing with this is you need to protect it, especially when it's young from winter winds. So oftentimes people love going out and they love getting the, their red buds. But if you, if you live on a street that gets a whole lot of wind, or if you have a side of your house that's exposed and gets hit with all those winter winds, your red bud might not make it through the winter, even though it's hardy. It gets, it's very sensitive. It's a, it's a forest tree. So it's used to having its bigger brothers and sisters around it to buffer it. So this is something that is great, you know, say maybe on the east, the east side of your house. Um, certainly not, you know, a south side tree because it wants, it's, a, it's another understory tree like the dogwood. So it's a, it evolved and grew up kind of un, under the, the shade or partial shade of its bigger brothers and sisters. So it doesn't, it'll take that part sun, loves that morning light, but does not want to be in a wind tunnel. So if you're in an urban environment, this is not one, if you have a street, like people put these out in the city and when the wind comes whipping down the street in between the buildings, it'll just burn these up. So it's a excellent tree to plant with. It's one of those that you'll forget about it. And then all of a sudden in the spring, right about now, this comes out and it's just wow, because at this time in the spring, our eyes are still really hungry for color. And this comes out kind of in a funky way. So we don't really see it coming. I personally love the big heart shaped leaves um, that it develops. There is a, a variety called forest pansy where the, the leaves are actually like a burgundy. Uh, and it does put on a great fall display um, as well. However, spring, as you can see in that last picture that just came up is, is when it really does shine. Although, like I said, I really love those heart-shaped leaves. So, Helicia, this is the silver bell. If you have ever seen or planted or played with the silver bell, this is um, a very, uh, I would say, underappreciated uh, tree. Has these beautiful, beautiful white flowers in late spring that turn into these wonderful little, little caps before it greens out but it is like these little delicate clusters are just absolutely gorgeous. And again, something that we don't see all the time. It's another 15 footer short, you know, short tree and something that you, you don't necessarily see everywhere. Understory tree. Again, that's what a lot of these, these flowering trees are mostly understory trees. They're the shorter ones. <clears throat> One that you rarely see. And when you do, you never forget it is the fringe tree. I would have to say, if you ever come by a fringe tree in bloom, it is, it is going to stick with you. 
Uh, you do not see many of them, not many people plant with them. So if you are looking to throw something in your garden uh, as kind of a showstopper, I mean, this is definitely one of them. This multi-stem, it comes as a single stem, a standard form and a trunk. However, you can get it in this multi-stem form <clears throat> and it just gets nice and full. And when you see these clouds, they're not there for too, too long. But when you come across this tree and you see these clouds, um, it is it is really something to behold. It is just a it's an incredible tree. And like the red bud, it's funky enough to really catch your attention. And like I said, if you have like this picture that's on the left, you see something like that, you're not going to forget it. And you're going to you're gonna, it's going to make you want to find out what that tree is. And now, you know. So this is one understory multi stem usually. And that's a good way to plant it. The red bud can also come in a multi multi stem, which is the one on the right, like you see. That's the fringe tree multi-stem, but a red bud can also come in, the, in that same form uh, as can some certain dogwoods will also come in that form. So if you want, if you want your tree to look less like a, a trunk with a canopy and you want to have um, a very like wild looking or uh, wide vase shaped version of any of these trees, the multi-stem version is, is definitely a way to go. And then it just gets these little delicate berries uh, once it's all finished which are just very pretty with the wonderful foliage. As I said, I focus a lot on foliage and you'll see why later on. Smoke tree, this is one I'm sure all of us have seen. Um, this is another one, very, this one is very easy to prune, uh, grows in many forms, but this is its, this is its flower that comes out uh, in the summertime and then kind of dries up and breaks off and kind of rolls around like a, a North American uh, tumbleweed. But when it has these wonderful clouds of smoke all over it, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. There are wonderful cultivars of this like purple smoke, which has really deep leaves. And I think it's called Sprite, which has like these really acid chartreuse leaves. Um, excellent in the landscape and then gorgeous in the fall again as these colors change, they put on like one final great display. So all of these that we've just talked about have a really funky spring or early summer flower, great fall display as well. <clears throat> Good showstoppers, not too, too tall. Uh, again, they, they stay in like that 15, 20 foot range. So they're gonna get up to your second story of the house. Um, 20 feet would be the top of those windows. So it'll get up in that, it'll get up in that area at full maturity. The Hawthorne, excellent, uh, excellent tree. For those of you who uh, do any foraging or who want to get into foraging, something that I, I play with just kind of on the side and do a lot with. If you were in last week's class, I was sharing with you chocolate dip tulips and um, lilac infused um, honey and simple syrup. So it's just, I, I definitely get into some of this, but the, the Hawthorne has excellent berries, super cool foliage, as you saw before, and these wonderful little summer flowers. It's a big, big one for birds. So if you, if you're trying to attract more birds, then you want to have something like the Hawthorne with all of those berries. So <clears throat> it is definitely the way to go. Now we'll get into shade trees. Now this is if you have space. Not all of us have space, um, but should you have space, these are the trees and you should you want shade trees. For instance, I'm doing a design right now, newer development, it's pretty much a level landscape with big houses in it. And they all these houses are getting cooked and cooked and cooked with, um, you know, fr from the southern sun exposure. So I'm I'm working uh, on their landscape and putting in big trees like this. If you want to see a tulip tree in all of its glory, you want to go to Lyman Estate in Waltham. If you drive right into Lyman Estate, you can't miss it. You go if you keep going straight towards the back, there is a tulip tree there that is just gigantic. And if you can catch it when it has these tulip blooms on it, it is absolutely magnificent. 
It is an amazing tree. And if you have the space for it, um, it gets huge. If you are one that is going to plant a tree for future generations, this is one that future generations are going to be like, wow. Now, something that really hurts my feelings, and I will just point, I will just say now, is this trend of everybody cutting down trees that are more than, say, 15 to 20 feet high. Um, we need big trees. As I talked about, are some of our birds really need big trees. And not every tall tree is a threat to our home or our landscape, et cetera. And especially if we grow our tall trees healthy with really healthy root systems in a really healthy environment, they're not necessarily going to go anywhere. And if we keep our big trees, a lot of our big trees fall over because they've lost all their friends. You'll notice in the forest, you have all these trees and they have friends around them. So when the wind comes, they all kind of sway together. They lean on each other like a bunch of, you know, drunk college kids kind of going down Yaki Way or something like that. They're all leaning on each other when that wind is blowing. That's what they need. Oftentimes what we've done now is we've left this one big tree just kind of all alone and it's got nobody to lean on. So when we get one of those microbursts or a down gust, it has nothing and it just keeps going when it, it starts rocking way too much. So we need to be careful with that. We need to think about how we tuck the trees into our landscape. The other thing is if we over if we over irrigate our lawns, we'll have trees with really near, uh, really shallow root systems. So we want to make sure that when we're establishing our landscapes, that we water deeply and infrequently. We want our landscape, whether it be our grass or our tulip tree. We want them to have really deep root systems so they can hold on. The other thing when we're establishing trees is unless you're in a really windy situation where the tree gets blown over a lot, they do not need those guy wires. They do not need to be strapped, strapped and posted up. Trees, they figure out their root systems by the wind. So if, a, if the wind comes from one direction, the tree will compensate by growing its roots out and around to compensate for the wind that blows oftentimes in that direction. Trees are extremely intelligent. If you've read The Secret Life of Trees, you probably know this. If not, do, do check it out because it'll definitely open your mind. But trees are extremely intelligent. So having trees on super irrigate, irrigated um, landscapes is not good because their roots don't have to go anywhere for water. And if you keep them strapped up so they don't blow around, the roots aren't gonna know where to grow to balance out when the wind starts blowing hard. So these are ways that we can have trees for a long time. The cool thing about the tulip tree is the tiger swallowtail. This is big if you want to have butterflies. So if you have the place for the, uh, for the tulip tree, it is, uh, it is a host plant for the tiger swallowtail. This is the piece that we often forget is that if we want butterflies, we need to plant our landscapes with butterfly food. And that just because something is nibbling our, our trees, our shrubs and our perennials does not necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Because oftentimes I'll get called after planting a pollinator garden and people will be like, oh my God, Trev, my, everything's getting eaten. And I'm like, not everything's getting eaten. And if you want to have all those butterflies that we planted those flowers for, you need to have the caterpillars to have the caterpillars, they need to eat something. So some of those plants are there to feed the caterpillars. Now, as you're feeding the caterpillars, you're also feeding the birds. So if you want to have a backyard full of chickadees and cardinals, etc., then you want to be having lots of caterpillars in, in, your, in your woodland. So here's the height. This is a big tree. This is twice, three times the size of a normal house. Magnolia virginiana, love this plant. Semi evergreen, so it keeps its leaves for much of the winter, if not all of the winter, and then loses them in the spring. Lemony fragrant white flowers, just absolutely, to me, absolutely beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Understated flowers, though, they're very simple. This is a very, very simple and demure plant, um, but I absolutely love her. She's just, she's very beautiful, extremely fragrant. As these, as these open, uh, I'll oftentimes try to work something like this into, say, the city or just off 
somebody's deck. There are certain plants that I love to plant kind of just out because she's not, um, as you can see in the, one of the images coming up right there, she's not a very like robust uh, tree. It's kind of sparse as far as branching is concerned. So people don't always, don't always love her. But again, once all those, all those blooms open, it's great. So I'd like to tuck her off because she likes part shade. I'll tuck her off to the side and then you'll be on your deck or people will be out there like in a city environment walking by and you'll get this whiff, this vanilla lemony whiff that comes through. Um, and it's just, it's, it's absolutely beautiful and it catches people's attention. Also the fact that she's semi evergreen, um, you know, is, is a plus because it, it'll kind of add that backdrop and that green to the landscape. Oxydendron. This one is, it can be a tough one to find um, depending on the year. Usually you cannot find a big one. So when you put one of these in, you're gonna have to let it grow. Uh, I absolutely love this tree. Uh, it does get to be, it can get to be pretty tall. Uh, if you ever travel Route 9 in Weston, there's a, a green, like an open, I don't know what the building is, but it has large oxydendron in it. Um, they're probably about 50 feet tall. Absolutely beautiful. Some people hate these pendulous kind of finger-like flowers, but it has these wonderful white uh, pendulous flowers in the, uh, in, in the summertime, usually around like June, which I find absolutely gorgeous. But right there is exactly why I plant it. It just turns this scarlet, scarlet red. It's brilliant uh, in the fall and definitely a showstopper. <clears throat> put it in, put it in some sun, let it go. But with those funky flowers and then those bright red leaves, it's got two seasons of just eye-catching, just awesomeness. The mountain ash, uh, these used to get planted quite a bit. You don't see them much anymore. Super cool flower cluster. Birds absolutely go crazy for this plant which is why I like it. And then all of these flowers turn to these wonderful orange berries. And you've probably noticed this plant if you've seen these clusters of orange berries. Drives the birds absolutely crazy. Doesn't get too, too tall. This is like another, I believe it's like a 20 footer. I've never seen these get super, super tall. Um, but it's a nice, uh, nice, you know, nice medium sized trunk, say four or five feet high. And then it branches out into, into a great canopy. So getting into our shade trees, we were kind of talking about those before, but now we're talking trees with really robust um, branching and leafing. So our sugar maples and our red maples, native to this area, big trees, great for shade. If you, have, if you are ever driving out, say Western Massway, if you're ever driving anywhere in old farm country, you'll see probably the sugar or red maples planted on the south side of the house. If you see two big maples on, the, on one side of the house, usually the front, and then you see a bunch of like giant spruce or white pine behind, that is an old planting. Because the, before a passive house became a thing and before we had all that AC and everything, the, the evergreens were planted on the north side to break the wind. And we had big giant maples planted on the south side to shade the house, to cool the house in the summertime. And then they would drop their leaves and the house would be warm in the winter, in the low winter sun. So these, these trees were strategically used in colonial, colonial New England <clears throat> and farming. So we have the, just the red maple leaves and the sugar maples and how gorgeous they get in the fall. Of course, you can, if you grow your sugar maple old enough, you can then tap it and have maple syrup, which some of my friends have done. But you get this wonderful fall color, <clears throat> the wonderful little seedlings off of, off of many of them. And then if you can get that leaf litter, some people might be looking at this and being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe raking all those leaves. Other people might be thinking, that's a really cool puzzle. That would be really hard. And then some people are like, wow, isn't nature gorgeous? So <clears throat> I don't know which category you fall in in there, and that's okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so the red maple and the Acer Rubrum, but this is what I wanted to get to, the big five. So your big five, if you want the Lepidoptera, which are the, the butterflies and moths. Uh, again, if you've read any Doug Tallamy, you'll know that an oak tree supports like 425 different species of butterflies and moths. However, the five trees, if you are looking to have butterflies and moths are gonna be your maples, the Acer, your birches, the betula, your cherries, your, pr your prunus, your oaks, which are the, cur the curcus, and your willows. So those are, those are the, uh, the five, the big five, if you are looking to get uh, more butterflies and moths via tree. Now we all know about pollinator gardens and putting in all sorts of pollinator flowers. These are where all the caterpillars start before they're beautiful butterflies on your flowers. So for our shade trees, we have our shag bark hickory. If you have a, a space and you like the funky, the funkiness of it, it's absolutely a great one with its wonderful nuts. I have a friend, a forager friend who makes these amazing brownies um, with hickory nuts, which I just think is super cool. You know, all these things that are just kind of like right there and they're just, they're around us, but we have forgotten to kind of use them. Um, so I'm not, you know, I, I dabble in the foraging. Like I said, I like my chocolate dip tulips and my uh, lilac infused honey. I would love to do the brownies sometimes, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend an afternoon collecting the hickory nuts. But if you have time or the, the motivation to do that, that's awesome. Yellowwood, another good one. <clears throat> Beautiful flower. Wonderful flower, wonderful branching structure. So, you know, if you have, if you have the, the space again for trees, these are definitely ones to consider because this, this kind of branching structure is gorgeous in the winter. So now you have that, that beautiful flower, that beautiful pea flower, and then you have that great branching structure. And then you have the of course, the brilliant yellow fall color. So like you get this giant cloud, which is pretty cool. And again, like, I don't know what any of your properties look like, but if you have a property and you can support a big tree, that would definitely be one to consider because she's beautiful when she's going with their beautiful white flowers and then that wonderful yellow. And then that great branching structure in the winter is, is, is just beautiful on a stark landscape. The American beach, this is one of my this is one of my favorite trees. I love the smooth bark. I really love almost everything about a beech tree. What I would like to point out here, because it's you can see it in this image uh, more than a lot of the others. When you are planting a tree, you want to expose the root flare. Oftentimes, when a tree is in a pot, or when you get a tree in a ball and burlap, that flare of the tree is four or six inches beneath soil. And what happens is that we plant our trees at the level of the soil they were in the ball and burlap, which is too deep. You can see in nature when trees grow naturally, that flare is right there on the surface. And if we want to have very healthy trees that are going to live for a long time and be disease resistant, we want that flare at the top. Oftentimes trees get planted too deep. If you just see like a lollipop stick, in the soil and no flare, that tree is too deep. Now the American beech is what we have in our woods. It's what I was talking about um, you know, earlier and how the American beech, you can see all those little guys in the background and all those little ones are just waiting for the canopy to open up. They're waiting for one of the older ones to go either in a storm or just to, you know, to old age. And then they're just gonna take that light and they're just gonna go has just these wonderful delicate green leaves, you know, in the spring, great branching structure, wonderful uh, habitat value, but it is a very big tree. The honey locust, people have a love-hate relationship with this. <clears throat> there is the true honey locust, and then there is the thornless version of the honey locust. Uh, honey locust has become a, uh, a big, very popular with street trees because it is very resistant 
Uh, it is a very strong tree. When allowed to do its thing, you can see it gets this gorgeous shape to it. It's extremely beautiful, I think. Uh, wonderful tree gets to be about 30 feet high. If you've ever seen a real honey locust, uh, and you can see them at the Arnold Arboretum. This is what you find. You find these thorns all over them. It's, to me, it's super cool, but it almost looks medieval. The one that you see mostly in the landscape now is the thornless variety. Now, I'm going to tell you why I, one of the things I love so much about the honey locusts. Food for ghosts. The honey locust evolved these thorns in the first, say, 20 feet of the trunk, because back when mastodons and ground sloths dominated the North America, they used to push on the honey locust to get those long beans that are in there. So this is like a, this is a very sweet story. It's a very sad story. So the honey locust developed all those spikes to keep the mastodon away from pushing over the tree until all those pods were ready and ready to fall to the ground because it's called a honey locust for a reason. The meat on these seed pods is very sweet and they have a honey smell to them. But the honey locust developed these spikes to keep the mastodon and the ground sloth away from pushing it over until the pods were ready to drop. And then they could just go and scoop them all up. So to me, it's a very sweet and just kind of sad story because they developed together and now we don't have that mastodon anymore. So it kind of lost its evolution friend. So it's, a, it's kind of sad. <clears throat> the larch, absolutely another fun kind of gorgeous tree, kind of like the new dawn redwood, which isn't necessarily a native, but it is one of those, we'll call them deciduous evergreens, if you want to call it that. Um, but they have just these wonderful, wonderful, delicate needles, really cool branching uh, all over them with wonderful little cones. So this is a tree that you have to appreciate. Like this is a tree that if you're going to just walk by and not appreciate your landscape, you're going to miss this one because this one has little tiny delicate needles, little tiny delicate cones, and then it turns this, this kind of fairy yellow, um, you can see in the, in the fall. Absolutely beautiful, but you until it does this, you will oftentimes miss uh, a whole lot of its beauty. This one, many of you may be familiar with, sweet gum. This is, this is, this is a banger. I don't know how else to call it. This is an autumn banger. Um, the sweet gum comes out and when it does its thing in autumn, it is just brilliant. It is yellow to red. It is like a sunset. It turns like deep burgundy in some areas and then just scarlet in others with little hints of yellow. So this is just a magnificent fall performer. Um, this is a great one. It's a really strong tree. So if you had to put like a tree or a couple of trees uh, and you wanted to just really Ta-da, in the back, like in the back edge of your property, this is definitely one of those. Um, and if you have a focal tree, this is not a bad one for that either. Um, they got really great branching structure, but really to me, it's all about the fall color on them because they are one of the, next to the, the sourwood, this is one of the deepest, most robust fall performers, I think. Um, they got the really fun seed pods, uh, which are great, but again, just that, that kind of red to deep burgundy uh, is amazing. If you have gone through Lexington, I believe, some Lexington Fire Department or one of them have this magnolia out in front. Super tropical looking tree, absolutely amazing. If you have space for a tree like this um, and you have the, I, I don't know, the, the patience or the personality to just be wowed by something that is so fleeting as the magnolia blossom. This is just an amazing, it doesn't, you, everybody, every time you see it, it looks like it's out of Hawaii. You don't, does not, you do not feel like it belongs here, but it is just a showstopper, absolutely magnificent bloom. Uh, and then these red pods just also just don't look real. This whole thing looks just alien, but it is one of our natives because it comes up with all these seeds inside those red pods. And so just birds absolutely love it. Super cool tree. Really big. Again, everything about it just seems tropical. So if you want to have something just kind of like big, funky, tropical, if you got a big space in your front yard or backyard and you want to get something, I mean, those blooms, they're amazing. But if you blink, 
you're going to miss them. It's not one, it's not a super, super long bloomer. Um, but it, it is magnificent. Like if you get this, you take a picture of one of those blooms, you throw it on Instagram, boom, you're good. You're good for a whole lot of likes. <clears throat> The black gum. This is another uh, really just it's a, it's a great. Rev, I'm, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's about 10 past five. I didn't know if you knew the time. So I wanted to sort of let you know. All right. Well, I'm trying. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry, sorry everybody. I'm doing my best. So. <clears throat> um, so with 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 the black gum, just another another great, another really uh, durable shade tree. Wonderful fall color. Wonderful berry. Another great one, but it's it's going to get tall for you. So if you're looking for that shade, if you're looking to do that, um, that's that's an excellent one. The birches, I love birches. Birches, the poem by Robert Frost, one of my favorites. Um, so this is, I mean, any the, any type of birch tree. However, there is a birch borer around, so you need to be careful in putting your birches, you know, in. You want to make sure that they don't get sick because there has been a, um, the birch borer has taken off and it goes after the, uh, the paper birch mostly. <clears throat> the gray birch can be identified on its leaves with a head like an elephant is the best, is the best way to identify that one. When you're trying to identify gray birch, there are so many different kinds. We think of birch trees, we think of the paper birch mostly, but we have the gray birch, river birch, if you want a, uh, this is one that I plant a lot. If you're trying to create a screen using the native evergreen arborvitae, like the dark American and the birch and planting those together in a screen, rather than just making a wall of evergreens, put the evergreen in the view that you hate the most, and then put these guys also in there. So during the season, you'll have when these are leafed out and you're out in your yard, you'll have wonderful shade and everything else and you'll have that screening and then in the winter <clears throat> once the leaves drop you have the golden leaves falling all over the evergreen and you'll have these whites the white trunks right there with the evergreen so they play off each other really well river birch grow very fast so if you're looking for that fast screen that's something that you want to be you want to be working for looking for um the black birch some of these are understated black and yellow birches you know, they, they have that funky bark. They all have that gorgeous yellow fall color and the, the real funky bark. Not as dramatic as the river birch, not as dramatic as the paper birch, but these are wonderful natives to look out for. And again, these are part of the big five. So if you can work some birches into your landscape or if you have them, you definitely want to maintain your birches in your landscape. And then we get to the cherries. The cherries were the other part of the big five. So the black cherry, some people consider this a weed tree. Um, if you have it on your property, you may or may not like it. However, it's wonderful bird food and it's uh, wonderful caterpillar food. They, uh, they both absolutely love it. So if you can tuck it into a hedgerow or somewhere in your landscape, it's not necessarily a focal tree like the ones we've been talking about, um, but it's a great one. <clears throat> So we have the black cherry, we have the choke cherry, which is almost like more of a shrub, I would call it, than a tree. They don't get very tall. They have wonderful edible berries if you can get at them. And again, if you like kind of that, that forage aspect, uh, you can eat many of those, but we will get into eating next week. So then we have oaks, wonderful oaks, strong oaks, great focal tree, great shade tree. Um, Certainly trees that when you know that are appreciated once they reach their age, once they reach their maturity. Um, not as not as brilliant as this picture um, when when they're young, but once they do their thing, they absolutely become just magnificent um, and perfect. And the great fall color will hold their leaves, feed lots and lots. Like I said, like over four hundred varieties of Lepidoptera, moths, butterflies are all on there. So if you're bringing the birds, then you definitely want to have your oaks. And then you can you can choose your oak by its by its leaf color should you feel you can choose your oak by its size, but they're all going to get big. Uh, oftentimes we're starting to see the scarlet oak put into into as a street tree and in the street in the in the tree lines along with some of the maples. Not bad because it is a durable tree. Um, it's durable and it's absolutely gorgeous. Scrub oak, if you're down on the Cape at all, you see this quite often. 
in most beachy environments, it's a great one, it's a low one. Uh, and some of these things, you, when you think about them and working them into the landscape, you know, this may, this, not every tree is a focal thing. Maybe some of these trees are put into screens to break up your screens in, you know, if you're trying to block a view or if you're trying to fill an area of your property and you're not really sure, by mixing some of these trees and shrubs in, you can fill out that area, create massive ecological benefit, uh, et cetera. And then finally, rounding out the, uh, the big five are the willows. So the pussy willows are just, just passing right now. They're just going by and then uh, they will just round out and just be totally green. Willows are great because they're really easy to prune. So, and they, they are really receptive to any kind of pruning. So you can, you can keep a willow to uh, most any size that you, would, uh, that you would be looking for. They do want to be big. They do want to make, them, make their way to be trees. However, again, very easy to prune, very easy to kind of keep to a shape that you might want. Um, they do prefer sunny areas and wetter soils. So if you live anywhere on a high water table, then your willows will be extremely happy. If you live on ledge where it is just super dry and nothing going on, then you will not have a very happy willow. So then moving off from trees, we'll get into the part that I really like. This is where I was actually just at um, Weston's yesterday and all of their native, native deciduous azaleas are coming in. The native deciduous azalea is absolutely one of my favorites. So we will get into that. The striped maple though first, another great understory tree could be considered a shrub, but it's actually a, a, a small tree. Really like fascinating bark, super cool bark, super cool branching structure. So again, if you're gonna be out, if you're gonna be appreciating the landscape, if you're bringing people in to appreciate your landscape or whichever, then this is one that you wanna have in there. Uh, just because it takes, it's a detail tree. Like you're gonna to have to be up on it. You're gonna to have to be in your garden to really appreciate it. <clears throat> and it's absolutely magnificent once it gets going. Calicanthus, Carolina allspice, the sweet shrub. Love this one. Great for shade, great for part shade. Deep blood red, fragrant flowers in June. Great fall color. This is, this is a durable one. And like I said, if I have like a shady corner, I almost always work this in. The more sun it has, the more bloom it has, the more bloom it has, the more fragrant it is. But if you can keep this in an area where you will appreciate the fragrance, it's an excellent one. And like I said, gorgeous, gorgeous on the fall color. So that, that's one that actually, I mean, Weston has always carried it, but now it's, it's actually become pretty, uh, pretty big in their thing because I ask for it all the time. I probably sell about 200 of those a season. So um, you can definitely find it there. The muscle wood, if you're looking for the winter interest, this is a great one. This is a great one for a number of sites, wet site um, especially. It's called muscle wood because it has those ripped trunks on it <clears throat> gets to be uh, gets to be pretty tall, but the branching structure on it, like as you can see in this picture, is just absolutely gorgeous. So for the winter landscape, this is a real fun one to put in, and one that I really like because it just comes out of the garden. Again, of course, fall color, as I've always pointed out. Galtheria. This is one that you can try. You've probably seen it. It's the winterberry. You've probably seen it looking like this probably right now in the in the winter and in the early spring. Um, it has that fall look right there. Galtheria is tough. It is very, it, it's, it's, uh, it likes some acidic soil. It's really tough to get going. Um, it's one that I really love and appreciate. I personally do not plant with it too much. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful creeping berry but it is, it's tough to get established. So if you want to try some out on your property, if you have some acidic soil um, that's not wet all the time um, and high in organic matter, then yes, you could definitely try this, but it is definitely one that I have not had a ton of success with getting it started. The witch hazels, talk about an off-season off -season showstopper. So we have the Virginiana, <clears throat> which is your um, October to December 
So on that like November day or whatever, if all of a sudden you see like a warm November day, October day, you see a bee buzzing around, it's probably looking for a witch hazel. Um, so this it's got that these crazy blooms from October to December. Again, this is one that if you really get up in your garden, you can absolutely uh, appreciate the funky blooms. <clears throat> And then we have the Renalis. That is, this one is a February to March bloomer, which is so. This is the native that blooms um, when you oftentimes think about, uh, you know, witch hazel in that early, that late winter bloom. Uh, a lot of the Asian varieties also bloom at that time. So if you had like one of each, you'd have that really funky bloom. Super cool fall color either way, but you'd have funky blooms way off season, kind of October to December, and then that February, March, early bloomer to kind of wake you up. Our native hydrangea, our native Annabelle. If you have heavy deer pressure, you need to stay away from this one, um, or you need to take precaution. This is an absolutely great shrub. I am planting an entire hedgerow with this um, coming up, but I am planting that hedgerow with things like Amsonia, and mountain mint and all the things that deer hate to try to protect it. Uh, the client is absolutely in love with this, uh, this shrub and has the perfect spot for it, but she's got heavy deer pressure. So we are planting every sort of perennial that I can think of in front of it so that we can hide the legs because she doesn't have the sexiest legs. Uh, so we're gonna hide the legs uh, with a lot of perennial color that will deter the deer but just absolutely beautiful native uh, hydrangea. The, this is an Annabelle, not like the hybridized Annabelles, which sometimes their heads are too heavy for their body. So this one usually grows in pretty good proportion. She's got a smaller head, so she doesn't necessarily fall all the way over. At the same time, not the showstopper like those big giant soccer ball blooms. <clears throat> and also plays host to some beneficial caterpillars, which is a good thing. And it's okay if, you're, if your hydrangeas got nibbled, again, that's absolutely fine. That's to be expected, that's what we want because in planting our landscape, we're planting an ecosystem as well. However, if your plant is getting decimated, that usually means that your plant is stressed out. So in choosing your plant, and I, I figured we'd be here about an hour and a half, I'm gonna run a little bit over, so I'm sorry. I'm trying to move as fast as I can, but I don't want to shortchange you um, with all this information because I love to talk about this stuff. So in picking your plant, you want to pick your plant based on the environment you're looking to fill, not the other way around. So right plant, right place. Don't just pick a plant because you like it or you want to have it if your environment is not conducive to it. Because no matter how beautiful it is, once it gets into its new home, if its new home is not suited for it, it will be miserable and it will not do any of the things that you want it to do. So it is better to just pick the right plant for the right place because then it will be gorgeous and do all the things you want it to do. Oak leaf hydrangea, one of my favorites. Absolutely, woodland hydrangea gets the, some of the varieties, the, the, the straight species get to be about eight feet, but a gorgeous uh, white bloom that ages out to a, a pinky red and then the leaves turn blood, blood red in the fall, which is just uh, absolutely amazing. But you get these wonderful white blooms that age out um, throughout the season. Wonderful pollinator plant, gorgeous, gorgeous fall color, uh, excellent showstopper. So any, any woodland garden, I'm definitely putting this in. Any woodland um, kind of property line or tree line planting, I'm working this in because when it's in bloom and when it's in, uh, when it's, in its fall color, uh, it's absolutely beautiful. And then if you're like me, you love the blooms after they've passed because it's just a beautiful kind of nature's putting on a show at all times. We just don't notice the show at all times. Lakothaway, this is something that you will see if you're driving, uh, if you're driving like through Amherst, this is growing all through the woods. Lakothaway likes that organic soil. It likes that moisture. Um, wonderful evergreen plant that just kind of grows in this mounding habit with these beautiful bell-shaped flowers all over it. So if you have like a, a moist or a, a, a hillside that you're trying to plant up, if you have like a, wood, a woodland garden area, 
that maybe is not tended to all the time, this will absolutely take off there. But it wants to have its its uh, organic soils <clears throat> in it. But gorgeous little white bell flower, reminiscent of the sourwood, definitely. And then it gets some really neat. It stays evergreen, but it has some wonderful uh, fall foliage and its new foliage when it comes in uh, is also a like a, a tan or a burgundy. Spice bush, if you got room for a large shrub, absolutely this one. Gorgeous little yellow flowers all over it. Wonderful display going on. The turn to great berries. The birds love them. The pollinators love them. And it is host plant to the spice, uh, the spice, the swallowtail. So that is another great one to bring in there. If you're trying to get your butterflies, spice bush is great because it's got the cool, uh, the great flowers, great berry, and it plays a great host plant. Gets to be about, can be, get to be about 15 feet tall if you just let it do its thing. The hop hornbeam, this is a great uh, smallish tree filling out an area. Really cool hop like flower, which is where it gets its name. <clears throat> great bark, oops, and fall color. The roadies, not all roadies are Asian. We actually have native rhododendron here, the great rose bay. Um, has this purpley flower. This is a rhododendron, the, max, the, the maximum. It has the big leaves, not the small leaf rhododendron. This is a big leaf rhodie, wants to be big. This is what rhodies want to look like. They want to be big. They want to be gnarled. They want to be forts for children. They do not necessarily want to be planted right up against our foundations. So we want to give the rhodie a place to spread out. It does not want irrigation all the time. It likes dry, acidic soil. So it wants to get wet, but it does not want to have, uh, it does not want to be constantly wet. It wants to have moist soil. It wants to have acidic soil. It wants to have organic rich soil with like a compost or some compost and leaf litter, uh, et cetera. But it does not want to be irrigated all the time and it wants to be big and gnarly. This is how she wants to grow. And then she will put on just wonderful displays for you. Uh, in the summer that we all love. So we can get that pink and white. We can fill out that dead corner, that dead shady corner of our property by putting one of these in here. But this doesn't necessarily want to be right up against our foundation. As I talked about the azaleas, these have just come in. I love these. Why do I love these azaleas? These are the, the deciduous azaleas, not the evergreen ones. They get to be, some of them get to be six to eight feet tall, as you can see. Uh, if you let them grow, they do get kind of on the leggier side if you just let them go without pruning them. However, you get amazing color and they show up in like June. Some of them show up in July. They have like a, a summer bloom. They come in multi-tone. Some of these are orange. Some of them are red. Some of them are white with pink stripes or pink with white stripes. Some of them are just like a gorgeous yellow. I do not necessarily design oftentimes with like a, an orange or even like a ready yellow, but I will drop these in because they're just one of those things that you put in six feet tall, mid to back of the bed in the sun. And it just is green, it's green, it's nothing, it's nothing. And then it's just covered with these amazing flowers and people are like, wow, what was that? And then it's gone, it just goes back to being green and just being a backdrop. But when these things kind of do, when they're doing their thing, they are just absolutely, to me, they're just absolutely amazing. So we are almost done, I promise. So tough plants for tough spots. Sweet fern, definitely, if you can make that happen. <clears throat> um, northern, the, uh, the, northern the northern bayberry, uh, Parthenocissus, which is the, um, the creep Virginia creeper, the low grow sumac, high bush blueberries, viburnum prunifolium, all great for that, that sun and drought tolerant. When you're doing shade tolerant, the Lakotha way that we just talked about, the rhododendron, shady, they like that dry shade. That's where they want to be. And then you can see with the wets, some of the, um, some of the, uh, the well, we get the blueberries and the cranberries, again, with the, with the wet. And we get the Ilex reticulata, which is the winterberry. So there's plenty of plants. Like there is no site that, is, that, that cannot be planted. So now to finish this out, because this is the last section that I promised you, would be the viburnums. Why do I like viburnum? Because viburnum blooms flowers. You get flowers in the spring. You get berries in the, um, in the, in the, 
in the summertime and then you get fall color which every every single time it's just it's just absolutely great so <clears throat> while we're having this you have these like i said every single species has a bloom has something going on so you have that spring flower that summer fruit that fall color always showy always great <clears throat> And there's always one for every for every single site, like I said. So the difference are in the details. We have plenty of native viburnum. So we have the, the hobble bush, which has this great heart-shaped leathery leaf, really cool. Um, like I said, kind of open clustered spring flower, clusters of red berries, and then it gets awesome again, fall color. <clears throat> Viburnum nudum. This is what you're seeing now. Oftentimes you get these, these clusters of kind of the pinky white flowers. You get these, the purple, um, the, you know, the purple or the deep blue berries. The birds absolutely love them. They go crazy for them in the fall. And then we have the uh, lentego, the nana berry, large clusters of flowers, which mean large clusters of berries, which are just great for the birds. And then we have these fall displays things you need to be kind of cautious of and think about are really kind of what size these get to. Most of them get to be about six to eight feet tall. Some get to be like 10 by 10 shrubs. As you can see here, this one gets to be about, that could get to be about 15 feet tall. <clears throat> the American cranberry, beautiful, beautiful red flowers. I mean, beautiful red berries in the fall, delicate, sweet smelling white flowers, the maple leaf viburnum, if you have dry, if you have a dry part sun or a dry site, the maple leaf is a great one, hence the name, you can see it right there. The maple leaf, that is one that I, um, I like to plant with a lot. The dentatums, viburnum dentatum are very upright, vase-shaped, um, if you have a tighter space. So those upright and vase-shaped um, are great ones to look for, the, the arrowwood viburnums. And then as we talked about the fall color, you know, flowers are fleeting <clears throat> and all of our, everything looks great in the summertime. We have flowers all through the summertime. So that's why, like I said, I design my way backwards. I work with winter structure. I work with fall color <clears throat> and making that happen. Oops. And you can see everything we've talked about from the dogwoods, this is the Parthenocissus, that's the Virginia creeper over there, the sourwood. You get all sorts of fall color in there. And just think about that, kind of moving your way backwards. It's because everything looks great. And then in the height of the summer, we have all of our perennials going, et cetera. So like I said, the viburnum, you get that early spring flower, you get that fall color, you get that summer berry. So it has the summer berry and that habitat value. You have the, like I said, that, that fall display. So when I'm choosing my shrubs, like I will choose a, a certain viburnum and maybe mix that with a clethra, which wasn't in here, but that has a gorgeous yellow. So I'm playing off like I have that red, I have that yellow. Then I work in something like an Amsonia as a perennial, which is also has a gorgeous, um, it's a lower kind of, it gets to be like 24 inches high. It's a perennial, but it gets gorgeous gold. And then I'll put that with maybe an Itia, another shrub I didn't cover, but that gets to be like three feet high and all in red. So I just, you put on this big fall display uh, in your beds, uh, and it's really it's it's just great. So when you're when you're designing, you know definitely work your way backwards. And that is part one. I appreciate you. Well, five thirty. I did pretty good. I landed right on the button. <clears throat> However, I know we have we still have questions. So again, only a couple. Everybody. Okay. So the first thanks, question everybody. is: What happened with the dogwood health problems from ten to twenty years ago? Are they done? Um, if you have, well, that's a, that's a long one, but, uh, I, I have not been experiencing the dogwood health problems that were there, uh, 20 years ago. And if you have your, if you make sure that you have your healthy soils, healthy soils will be healthy plants. Healthy plants are disease resistant, just like people. If you have all your good food and you have your good sleep, you will be disease resistant. Just like, uh, plants are the same. Can you plant river birch near the edge of the woods? You can. It wants. It might want a little bit more light, but um, it would definitely, uh, definitely, if 
maybe if you pulled it out a little bit, it would be fine. And I think it would be pretty there. The more shade they get, the thinner they are. That's all. So if you really want it nice and robust uh, and you really want to have good uh, bark color, et cetera, then you want to give it some more sun, but it will definitely thrive, look good there and be a fast growing screen. Okay. Can you buy goldenrod or do you only dig it up? You can buy goldenrod. Absolutely. Okay. Problems with viburnum leaf beetles? Yes or no? Yes. It's something that you have to wash out for, not all. So last year I had problems on many sites with viburnum leaf beetle, um, but in prior years I have not. So some years the pressure is a little bit heavier. And again, if you have a healthy plant and you focus on having really healthy soil, your plant will be more uh, insect pest resistant. Uh, I talk about that a lot on our Thursday night meetings. If you ever wanna come to those, I, I talk often about that. Um, and the, the roots of here. huge elms and pines. Uh, is that an issue? I don't know what that means. Says, what about the roots of huge elms and pines? Amy, can you clarify? Sure. I was just thinking, like, you know, I'd love to have some undercover trees, yep. but we're talking hundred foot pines. And yep. I just I don't want to start destroying the root systems of the existing trees in Correct. order to get the under stuff. Yes, so you do not want to necessarily cut, dig out, break any major portion of the root system. However, the, the thought that you can't plant a lot of woody things really close together, if you think about the woods, that's all that it is. It's trees and shrubs planted right on top of each other and they all do fine. There's plenty of nutrients, plenty of everything in the soil as long as you make sure that it's there. If you make sure you have healthy soil, you're good to go. In planting, just as long as you're not um, cutting too many or major root systems. If you can plant smaller and wait, that's great. Because that like, if you can plant a smaller tree, say like um, what's called like a number five or a number seven, it's one of those pots that are like this. If you can plant something like that, that's easy to get in the ground without cutting too many. It's, it's only gonna be like five, six feet high probably, but then it will grow into its space and it will make all of its friends rather than trying to put a giant tree right in there and having to cut all the roots because then that's not a good way to enter the neighborhood if you kind of blow everybody open. So that would be my suggestion there. 